Probably time to get started. Um, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed lunch. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Jim and Nikki. Uh, Jim Masarud is a software engineer at Grok Learning um, and has also been volunteering to teach at the NCSS summer camp for how many years? Many, two, five years. Five years. Um, Nikki has been doing the same thing, at volunteering teaching at NCSS for longer than that. She's also Dr. Nikki Ringland, has a PhD in computer science uh, and works at the Australian Computing Academy. And they're going to tell us about teaching kids to program with Python with microbits. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katie. Uh, yeah, so to start off with, uh, we do respond to heckling via tweets um, and Slack responses. So this is, this is how to get in contact with us later. Um, but first, let's talk about the summer school. So the National Computer Science Summer School uh, is run out of the University of Sydney. We get about 100 kids from across Australia and New Zealand. We bring them in for a residential camp. It's super intensive. Uh, we have a few of our progeny in the front here um, and the back. <laughs> Uh, and it's the most amazing experience for these kids. Uh, we split them into streams, and we're going to talk about the, the different streams later, but there's a lot of Python involved. Um, and the other really awesome thing about the summer school is that it's for teachers too. Shout out to my teachers in the back uh, and front. Um, so uh, if there are any teachers here, I've heard that there are, uh, you can come along and uh, learn Python and computer science and super exciting things for 10 days of your summer holidays because if you're the sort of people at PyCon, you, you want to come along to that as well. Um, the other thing that the National Computer Science School uh, does is the NCSS Challenge. Uh, it's running at the moment, and we're currently teaching 10,000 kids uh, and counting Python. Um, so if some of the tutors look a little bit distracted, um, it's not necessarily just because we're boring. Uh, but what we want to talk about now is teaching electronics uh, at the summer school specifically. OK, so the summer school divides the students, 120 students, into two streams. One stream does Python web development. The other stream does embedded. Um, for the past several years, that's been Arduino. Um, and for the first time this year, it was Microbit. Um, our goal here is to take students who've never done any electronics before or any sort of embedded system stuff and cover as much as we can. It's in a fairly intensive 10 days. We do lectures and labs. We cover everything from analog, a um, little bit of um, data processing, um, circuit design. Um, at the end, we teach them how a CPU works, um, robotics. We have these amazing little Microbit robots. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly intense course, but a lot of fun. Electronics is really hard. It's not called hardware for nothing. Um, and teaching students who've never done any of this before and are lacking any context in this is, is, a, is an incredible challenge. At the summer school, we're incredibly lucky that for um, every student, every three students has, a one, has one tutor. So we're not short of support, but we still have a lot of problems, from wires falling out to kits breaking to um, circuits that don't work, software that doesn't work. Debugging everything at the same time is a huge challenge for us. And our goal here is to make this approachable and exciting for students. And we don't want them to walk away with an experience where they're, oh, this electronics thing was interesting, but it just seemed really frustrating and hard. And we got stuck all the time. And we don't want to create that experience for them. This is a photo from a few years ago, um, right before the project was due to go. Um, things are not working. And we're out in the field in this case. Um, uh, we'll see more details about this in a second. But um, with electronics, you're stuck with your, your ability to, to debug it. We had, I think, a few multimeters with us and stuff like that. Um, it looks like somebody's pretty much disassembled this entire circuit. But a lot of, a lot of time is spent in this sort of situation, like, oh, what's going wrong? Where, where do I even begin? Yep. It's really hard, and our students are novices. Um, some of our tutors are novices, too. A big part of the summer school is that it's also a great teaching environment for the tutors. This is a, is this your oh, yeah. okay. um, again, debugging, exciting, but um, this is sort of moments before frustration again. Um, and we don't hold back. Um, digital analog converters. Um, capacitors, transistors, digital logic. Um, we really, really do run through a lot of content. And, and we'd love to find every possible way to make this easier. <laughs> Same student from before. <laughs> a bit more frustrated at this point. <laughs> um, so we want to tell you a bit of a cautionary tale 
um, <laughs> if you'll uh, bear with us with story time with Nikki. Um, a few years ago, we ran the embedded system. So, so the, all the photos you've previously seen uh, weren't using the micro bit. They were using Arduino, um, which uh, is, a, a, let's say, a bit more challenging to learn with. Um, so uh, let's go back and revisit that field trip we had. Um, the project uh, was exciting and optimistic and um, all of the things that you want in a project, it was engaging. But they're really a little, I mean, that's a half-hearted thumbs up at best. <laughs> <laughs> and if we zoom out a little bit more, you realise that this is because they're trying to debug uh, their project while it is literally metres away from the plane that it's supposed to go up in. And it doesn't work. <laughs> And there's not a lot you can do about that. At that point, I mean, we ended up recording this, uh, the, the data that we were hoping to record on an iPad instead. Um, we really want kids to, to feel like a sense of accomplishment and get a working project and then iterate on it as well. And having a project that works, but then a wire falls out at the last minute and the whole project falls down is really frustrating. Um, I just realized. In the green shirt, closest to the plane, uh, now is about to get a PhD in quantum computing. So, great, great tutor support. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good, good tutor support. Um, so, so this was the project in 2013. Uh, we were trying to get a weather balloon up and, and track it using Arduino. Um, there were a few things that went right. Um, that look of, oh my god, look at what we achieved. This is fantastic. I did a thing. Um, also counted by Jim's lack of sleep in the middle there. Um, uh, th that's what we were really looking for. But, but there were a few stumbling blocks along the way, including issues with radio licensing, uh, launching a weather balloon uh, requiring additional permits, uh, an extreme fire risk danger driving into an area with a busload of children where the plan to pop the weather balloon was to overheat a resistor. Uh, look, it was tricky, and then there was a thunderstorm to back it all up. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was a challenge. If you'll notice there, there's actually a child hiding under the truck. <laughs> but despite everything that went wrong, and plenty of things went wrong, the students had the most amazing time. Um, they, they loved every minute, especially the bits that went wrong, in fact. But we're trying to get that excitement and engagement that you can do with computer science and electronics and embedded systems, and maybe reduce a few of the things that went wrong. So the, the upshot of Arduino is that it's, it's great for hackers. It's great for people who are already confident in programming, a little bit at least, but it's a bit harder for learners. So like I've already mentioned, software and hardware at the same time is hard. Students would come to us with, it's not working, and we wouldn't know whether or not to tutor them as a software problem or tutor them as a hardware problem. And that 15 minutes while we figure that out is just frustration for the student. Um, a single wire falling out can be completely catastrophic. You lose two hours on a project. Um, and Arduino is hard. It, it, at the end of the day, it's C++, and people don't kind of give you that face when you say C++ for a reason. Um, <laughs> and, and Bluetooth is really hard as well. Um, one of the things we always wanted to do with the project is have them communicate with each other, and our experience with Bluetooth and Arduino was nothing but, but, but hassle. So the microbit. Um, the microbit is an amazing project um, run by a bunch of different organizations, um, ARM, the BBC, the Python Software Foundation, Tech Will Save Us, um, just to name a few of many. Um, and the project involved giving a device, a single microbit computer, to every grade seven student in the UK. Something like a million of these were made. And um, now they're available in Australia as well. And they are a very powerful little device, about four times as powerful as a typical Arduino. Um, they run an ARM microprocessor, so the same family of processors that are in your mobile phone. But more importantly, they have a lot of very important onboard functionality. If you are teaching electronics and programming, it's hard to beat them. They are a truly amazing device. They are r robust. You can throw them. You can drop them. Um, the, the, all the electronics is very low profile. It's very hard to knock anything off. They look nice. They don't look intimidating. Um, and there's a better picture for everyone. Um, uh, they run Python. We'll talk about how to get one later. Um, they're not very expensive compared to Arduino as well. Um, and they run Python, which is why we're all here. 
So specifically, they run MicroPython. And, and in the Internet of Things Minicomp, there's a lot of discussion about MicroPython today. But it's basically Python re-implemented for microcontrollers. It has all of the functionality of regular Python. Um, modular, some of the libraries are missing. But like, there's, there's micro versions of a lot of those libraries. But all of the great things you like about Python, string processing, um, using numbers without worrying what type they are, all just works. And for the 99% of things you want to do on a microcontroller, you don't care that it's 100% efficient right, written in C and assembly. You just want to read a button and set an LED or parse some string data from a sensor or something like that. In particular, um, when things go wrong on an embedded device, you've got to figure out why. And on a C++ bit of code on a microcontroller, it just doesn't work. On Python, you get a stack trace. It tells you which line. It tells you what you did wrong, almost. Um, and the REPL, the, the interactive prompt on Python, you can run on the device while connected to all of your electronics. And you can see, well, what happens if I change the state of this pin? What if I read from this pin? What if I read from this sensor? So for students to iterate and experiment towards understanding what's going on, they can do it so much quicker um, and with so much better reinforcement of the things that they're learning as they're going. On board, so I've got a list here, but we can run through the photo. Unlike an Arduino that has a processor and an LED, the microbit has 25 LEDs on the front. You can make little pictures with it. It has a compass, an accelerometer, two buttons, um, and a radio, um, and a temperature sensor as well. Um, not a very good temperature sensor, but um, nonetheless. Compare this code from Arduino on the right to Python on the left to read whether a button is pressed and to toggle an LED. Um, I'm sure people who've done a lot of Arduino can probably find ways to make this marginally better. But look at all the little things you have to remember and know about. I've got to know about pull-up mode on a, on a button input. I've got to remember to set the LED to an output. Um, I can't just see if the button was pressed. I have to check if it's currently pressed and whether it's had a transition. On the micro bit, we don't have to teach any of this until much later. We can get them going immediately and writing things that are useful. And it has radio. My favorite thing ever from Sesame Street is the, the Martians and discovering the radio. Radio. Yip, 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 yip. Um, <laughs> yip, 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 yip. Radio is really important. Um, and Nikki's going to talk in a second about why this is especially important for teaching Australian school kids. But it's also easy. So we've heard a little bit uh, before in some of the talks about the new digital technologies curriculum that's been rolled out in uh, across Australia. Asterisk, New South Wales to come. Um, so one of the parts of the curriculum explicitly requires teaching networking. Uh, now, if any of you know any sysadmins at schools, you know that they are reluctant at best to let students just go nuts on the school network. So we need to figure out a way of teaching networking and security and how data is uh, transmitted and processed without using the school network. Uh, and some teachers who are more confident in networking can set up their own mini networks. But actually, a really good alternative is to use the radios on these to, to set up a wireless network amongst the students. So you can get students to uh, develop and iterate their own protocols for transmitting data between microbits. And letting them experiment and come up with their own, uh, their own protocols makes them far more tangible, far more achievable, and far more fun as well. Um, so this is, a really, this is my favorite way of teaching the networking part of the curriculum. Um, so one of the really good benefits of teaching microbit as NCSS is that we're now teaching Python across both streams, uh, embedded and that the Python stream is unsurprisingly also in Python. Um, we used the Grok Learning platform um, and the microbit notes in that, which let the tutors uh, really engage with students as they had questions. Um, it was far more self-paced, uh, and it was basically a revolution. The students could focus on their code and understanding the computer science components, what programming is. A lot of them had never done any programming before, uh, before we then introduced electronics concepts. Um, and, and absolutely, getting something working on this, the hello world for a micro bit, is really quite simple. And that feeling of accomplishment led to really uh, high levels of confidence in the students, with, which then let us achieve even more. Uh, it's really powerful to have that easy win going in and continued success. Um, and the projects that we ended up with uh, at the end of the, the summer school were really fantastic. Uh, do you want to talk yeah. about the projects? There's something quite amazing about having got the software stuff out of the way and a student coming to you and saying, I would like to add this thing. Tell me what the electronics I can do to add this to my project. 
Whereas before it was like, oh, no more electronics because that's just going to be harder and more software. Um, so the project is a roughly health-themed project. This is after the, at the end of the 10 days, and we ask the students to break up into small groups and come up with some sort of exercise that uses the micro bits and other, other things that we give them as well um, to make a game that involves some sort of health-related activity. Um, the, a common interpretation of this is competitive push-ups or something like that. Two teams seeing who can do the most push-ups, and the micro bits record them and score them. Um, and we pretty much, that's as far as we go with the explanation, and we let the students be creative. A big part of this is that there's a, a huge non-software, non-electronics component as well. You'll see in a minute in the photos, there's effectively what I like to call like craft almost. Like it's, it's they build cool things as well. You know, scissors and cardboard comes out. Uh, loads and loads of masking tape. Um, we also give them these line-following robots. It's actually a slightly different one than, than you'll see in the photos. But... They, can, they came up with interesting ways to use the, the physical motion of the robots to tie into their activities as well. Um, a big part of these projects was encouraging the students to ask questions about what they were doing. So um, we add a new sensor, and they want to figure out how to use it. And we don't say, here's, here's the code you use to do this. Um, here's a library. We say, well, what do you think this sensor does? What is the thing actually trying to measure? How would we deal with things like that? How do we detect? How do we threshold a sensor value? How do we detect a change in that sensor value? Um, you can't just compare the last value because it might just be noisy or something like that. And so getting the students to think through what they were trying to achieve and then the much simpler way of expressing those ideas in Python really encouraged us to, to, found, to build foundations on how these things worked. And we added more PyBoard, uh, sorry, uh, MicroPython. So the PyBoard is, 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 the, is the official Python board, MicroPython board. The ESP8266 adds Wi-Fi. So a couple of students also experimented with uh, adding literally Internet of Things to their projects by making their health games talk to a website or, or, a, or a scoreboard or something like that. The Pi board can show up like a USB keyboard. So we had games where the, effectively the things that they were doing in the physical world were sending key presses to a computer controlling a real game on the computer. And we use the radio a lot. A big part of a sensor, a health thing, is you're doing sensors, and you want lots of things measuring different things, all talking to each other and, and merging that data together. And with the radio, we just we didn't have to think about wiring all over their bodies and stuff like that. That would have been really annoying. Um, the microbes all just talk to each other, and, and that made everything so much easier. So we want to show you a few of the projects that students actually uh, built. Um, there's a YouTube link uh, as well if you want to see the projects in action. So some of the, the, each group of students, each small group, had to uh, produce a video explaining uh, their project as well. It's well worth looking into. Uh, so the first one that we want to talk about is Dance Dance Revolution. We had not one but three different implementations of Dance Dance Revolution, and they were fantastic. They were all implemented slightly differently. Some used uh, flex sensors in little boxes. Um, there's a lot of creativity that goes into the design of these projects, even if it's just replicating a, a game that they know in real life. Um, I particularly liked Human Flappy Bird. Um, so in this uh, project, a student has a micro bit strapped to them, and there's another one on the wall over there that you, can, that you can't really see. Here's another action shot. Um, so yeah. Flappy Bird shows you the pipes that you need to jump over and duck under. Um, and it's, a, it's competitive, of course, because uh, that's what Flappy Bird should be. Um, there was an arm wrestling robo race. So uh, the micro bit that is uh, <laughs> between the, the tutor's hands and in this case, micro bit. And then, good, yeah. robust micro bit. Um, uh, the accelerometer was used to control um, the, uh, uh, the, the robot at the front. And whether the robot went forward or backwards, uh, was determined by who was winning the, um, the arm wrestle. Um, there's a ski-free microbit style in which uh, a student is holding microbits um, and has to do sort of lung laugh skiing constantly. Uh, it's pretty exhausting, as it turns out. And the, um, the NeoPixel strip lets them know how far they're going and how far they need to continue to go uh, to win the skiing race. Uh, there were, as Jim said, all manner of push-ups and sit-ups that were uh, done in the name of science and electronics. Um, it's quite impressive to see uh, these students, uh, how, how uh, cruel they are with their tutors <laughs> at the end of the week. Um, That's my 
Uh, but the crowd favorite, I have to say, was a project called Dab Dab Revolution. Nikki, what's a dab? Uh, for those of you who don't know any teenagers, a dab <laughs> is something a little like this. Um, this is also an acceptable dab. Uh, and here you start to see where Dab Dab Revolution comes into it. Um, but it would be boring for me and Jim to just do some dabs. So instead, we've got a little demo of Dab Dab Revolution that we'd like to do for you. So this is a much simpler version. But basically, it's going to be hard if I can't see that. <laughs> but what I have is strapped to me. You want, maybe you want to, I have four micro bits strapped to my arms. And these micro bits are detecting the motion of my arms. So the student's version was much more complicated. It had flex sensors in the elbows. and um, it, connected, it connected up to a screen with a scoreboard and stuff like that. Why isn't, why isn't the speakers working? There's supposed to be sound coming out, but I've, um, it goes... Ding ding That way. I think you're not fast enough for it, Jim. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so this was actually hooked up to... Uh, <laughs> this is just the next five minutes. Um, <laughs> So if you want to leave now... I can do some sit-ups too. No, I don't <laughs> want to do sit-ups. So there's a lot of room for creativity uh, in the scope of these projects um, and, and also fitness apparently as well. Coordination is left to the user. Um, but there's additional ways that we, we would recommend in accessorizing your micro bit if you want to do these sorts of projects or other projects. Um, so the, the bit bot, the robot body, these are fantastic. They're so cute. Come and uh, play with it in the break or in afternoon yeah, tea. Um, the Neo pixels that we saw in Ski Free are super bright and shiny. They're actually attached to this body as well. There's a few. Um, get some breadboards for when you dive deeper into the electronic side. Um, the MyPower backpacks that are used, that are strapped to um, Jim's one, they're just screwed in. There's a speaker, which in this case didn't quite work. Um, get some flex sensors and other sensors, uh, all sorts of things. And of course, the best part, the best accessory to microbits is more microbits so that you can use radio um, more powerfully. Um, there's so much fun you can do. So basically, in, in general, microbit was a massive winner at, at National Computer Science School uh, because it improved student confidence. And that led to better student outcomes. Um, the fact that we could do teach Python first and focus on learning computer science concepts and then add in electronics when the student was ready for it and as the student was ready for it was a fantastic improvement. And we just love the microbit radio. They're really, it's, it's such a fantastic way of getting networking going, getting projects that can be easily extendable. Uh, and then the final thing is these microbits are just so damn cute. Uh, as soon as a student gets a smiley face on one of these, they're hooked. Um, they have a lot of buy-in, uh, and they suddenly want to make more things, more exciting photos. Um, so this is NCSS. Uh, we think the microbit would work really well in, in classrooms. In fact, I know it does. Um, it certainly works well at the, the science school. We have a bunch of thanks, um, especially to Wise Tech Global, for donating a bunch of uh, the, the microbits so that all the students could take them home. Um, that was really fantastic. Um, and some additional links. And, and where to buy it. So where to get your own. The uh, microbit was distributed by Farnell, and in Australia that's element 14. So they do bulk um, sort of 100 quantity orders. But in, sh in smaller quantities, Little Bird, Core Electronics, and Tronics Labs are all fantastic for all sorts of electronic stuff. Um, and they have the, the microbits and, and some accessories as well. And then Fortronics uh, and another company called Kittronic, they do um, additional kits. This is the Fortronics BitBot kit, and it's wonderful. Um, Highly recommend. Oh, that was the sound of my dab. You finally up. did a dab. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, this is where to find us. Uh, questions? If there are no questions, we might ask for another demo. <laughs> um, but are there questions? I'm sure there are. Yes. Do you have examples or lesson plan about how to use uh, Wi-Fi so you connect them to teach uh, network for the curriculum? Ah, for, uh, so uh, specifically not, not Wi-Fi but radio. Uh, we don't have lesson plans on how to cover that uh, yet, but that's actually something that um, with my Australian Computing Academy hat on, uh, we'll be looking to do in the near future. Um, fingers crossed, soon. 
Uh, if you're interested in that, um, shoot me an email uh, or tweet at me so that I can make sure that you get a copy. And, and Grok it. has a course that, yep. that includes some radio parts for the micro bit. Uh, so um, the Grok learning resources that uh, we used at NCSS, um, that course also covers uh, using radio um, and, and a bunch of other stuff. Question at the back. Did you get a chance to document all those awesome projects so that the rest of us can go and grab code snippets and use them as inspiration for our students? Um, we actually, so Grok has a blog, and it's an upcoming post on the blog. Um, we have a, an existing post that's a bit of this content, but we are planning to go through the projects and write a bit more about them and what went wrong, what didn't, yeah, what worked really well. Better than that, we got the students to document That's true. <laughs> their own projects. So they're all up on GitHub, um, and if you shoot me a link, I can uh, show you where they are. The YouTube videos, um, yeah. The, yeah, the, the YouTube videos are, are the best place to start. Um, with a bit of polish, yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, with the microbit, you can buy a microbit. You can buy a microbit that comes with AAA battery pack. You can buy a microbit that, that then has an extension of a microbit backpack with the CR2032. Um, which do you recommend for classrooms? So one of the easiest kits to buy is a micro bit with the battery pack that Nikki's showing um, and a USB cable. So that, I'd say that is the minimum kit to buy as a, as a micro bit. These little backpacks are pretty good in that, in that they're very small. And so these, these add a little uh, 2032 coin cell battery. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, they, um, uh, the problem is when the battery runs out, they're a bit of a fiddle to change and, and things like that. Um, I don't have, and the, the battery doesn't last very long. Um, I think it depends on the project, but uh, the other thing is the these ones that you can replace with the JST, anything with the JST connector, so LiPo batteries as well, but the microbit doesn't have a charge circuit. So. For a classroom, I would recommend getting mostly uh, just the basic, uh, these batteries, and a couple of the backpacks, so that for students who want to do something with music or with a speaker, get it playing yeah. Bach, you can do it. Not sure why. Um, then they can use those ones, um, or they can even radio to those ones to, to use it. Was that another question? It's a bit of a follow up. I think the twenty. Wait, just wait for the mic. Yep. Okay, uh, I believe that some uh, an entire state has banned CR twenty thirty twos in schools because uh, kids can quite badly hurt themselves, yep. uh, especially if they're indiscriminate with what they swallow. Um, <laughs> So I'm wondering if you can use the, the sound without the 2032. So there's um, a bunch of accessories you can get. One of the, one of the great examples is it, it alligator clips. So part of the micro bit is that these, these pins down the bottom are designed to fit alligator clips, so you can very quickly connect them to things. Um, and there's one I've seen which is a pair of alligator clips that goes to a headphone jack. Um, and there's another one I've seen that has an amplifier and a speaker in it as well. Uh, I definitely would recommend that as the... Um, the way to do it. Questions? Yes. Um, I was just curious about the BBC uh, UK experience. Just what I think you said it, but what age were the kids? Like all the kids got one of the devices. How how old were they? I didn't quite catch that. So that was every student in the seven in the UK. Um, so. 12, 13 ish. Um, the, one of the big challenges with the UK rollout was that um, they, they sent the micro bits out to the classrooms, but the micro bits were actually supposed to go to the students directly. Um, some of the teachers weren't necessarily confident in actually using these devices in, in the classroom, so a lot of them, unfortunately, are still in a cupboard somewhere. Um, an interesting follow-up as well. They were targeted at grade seven students, and they're certainly applicable to grade seven mm -hmm. students. An amazing thing about the microbit is that they actually scale up. I've heard about universities picking up the microbit as, as a first-year unit. Uh, for my own personal electronics projects, often the first thing I grab if I need to test something or do a little computer side of a, an electronics project, 
often the micro bit is the first thing I grab. It's the easiest thing I've got to use. So if I just need a serial console or something like that, yeah. And, and they, they certainly work well in primary school as well, in primary school environments. You can program them with uh, block-based interfaces as well. Um, there are several different block-based interfaces to choose from. Yeah, thank you for that, because that was sort of dovetailing into my second question, which was just like, what other ages have they been trialed with? But also I was interested to know, like, what was the, UK, um, maybe I'll come chat with you guys afterwards, but like, I was really interested to know, like, what was the goal? Like, it's a big, big deal. It's sent it out to every kid in the country. But like, what was the goal from the UK government? What were they looking to achieve? And then what was the follow-up and how did all of that play out? I think I could talk about that for several hours. Um, I think the main goal was to really boost computer science in the classroom. They have a new curriculum that was released a couple of years ago. Um, and there are a lot of uh, sort of company-led initiatives to help support the teaching of that curriculum. Uh, this is somewhat related to that, to bring back the glory days of the BBC Micro um, and, and really get the, the UK population excited about their computer science uh, legacy, history, and uh, future. Um, it's been relatively successful, uh, and certainly we're keen to learn from their uh, experiences. OK, that's all the time for questions that we have. Uh, let's thank Nikki and Jim again. And here is a gift. Oh, thank, thank you. you thank you. Uh, by the way, if you have questions about NCSS in general, um, you can ask any of these people who'll be around PyCon um, the next few days. Uh, <laughs> it's like, where's Wally? Um, cool.